150 years ago, a young Jesuit scholastic dignified the Pigeon House on the roof of the Mission House building by calling it an observatory. That day marked the beginning of the long and rich history of the Manila Observatory, the scientific research institution of the Philippine Jesuits advocating a science-based approach to sustainable development and poverty reduction. The observations of Francisco Colina from the said Pigeon House proved to be useful and relevant when a great typhoon transversed the area in September 1865. This piqued the interest of fellow scholastic Jaime Nonel, who constructed curves from Colina's observations, which were published later on in the Diario de Manila. Businessmen and mariners took interest in it, and so they asked the Jesuit fathers to undertake routine observations and bulletins. They even financed the purchase of appropriate instruments in Europe. And so, from its humble beginnings, the Observatory Meteorologica de Manila was finally established under royal decree issued in 1884. Later on, during the American occupation, it would be recognized as the Philippine Weather Bureau. Through the intersection of excellence in scientific observations and research and the observatory's mission to serve the community, the Jesuit forefathers made significant contributions in the fields of meteorology, seismology, and astronomy. Federico Fara became the director of the Middle Observatory in 1886. After careful analysis of meteorological data acquired for almost 14 years, Padre Farah finally announced his first typhoon warnings in 1879, making him the first scientist in the Far East to predict the existence, the progressive movement, and the possible trajectory of cyclones. He sent his warnings to various parts of the archipelago via telegraphic messages. Now, since Padre Farah wanted to share the fruits of his labor to all, he invented the Aranoid Barometer that displays the laws governing the presence, movements, and strengths of typhoons in tropical latitudes. These were engraved in the face of the barometer, and in simple terms, it graced offices, ships, and even homes. Succeeding Padre Farah in 1897 was Padre Jose Algue, himself an inventor and a meteorologist. During his term, the observatory established hundreds of meteorological stations all over the archipelago, which greatly expanded the service of the observatory. Based on the data gathered by the observatory since its inception, Padre Elga wrote Bagios o Ciclones Filipinos, the first book on typhoons in the Philippines. He also invented the Baro Cyclometer, a combination of the Fara Aranoid Barometer and the Cyclonometer, which indicates the position of the center of a cyclone and allows the calculation of the storm center's direction. It was widely used by mariners in the country. The U.S. Navy even requested Padre Arabe to make one fit for use in the Atlantic. As though following in the footsteps of Padre Farah and Padre Alge, Father Miguel Selga served as the observatory's director from 1926 to 1948. He spent the last two years of his theological studies in the United States to learn English and to be exposed to the latest advances in astronomy. During his stay at the Lick Observatory, Father Selga made thousands of observations of Gamma, Epsilon, Orionis, and Sigma Scorpii. As a result, he was able to determine the period of rotation of Sigma Scorpii, a significant scientific discovery in this field. Because of the need to inform the public about earthquakes, the Jesuits also made significant contributions to the development of seismology, then a relatively young science. They installed the first seismographic station in the Middle Observatory in 1868. Father Juan Ricard of the Ateneo Municipal de Manila developed the first earthquake detecting instrument in 1869. The first recorded earthquake on this pendulum instrument, known today as a seismoscope, was in October 1st, 1869. Padre Farah used it to make daily reports on the great earthquake of July 1880. This led him to being honored as the adopted son of Manila and the renaming of the street where the observatory used to stand to Calle Padre Farah. Upon the official establishment of the observatory's seismological section, Father Miguel Sidera Maso started setting up a network of secondary seismic stations throughout the country and equipped the central station in Manila with the latest developments in seismographs. He was in charge of this section for 33 years, and in 1895, he published the first work 
about earthquakes in the Philippines, which was followed by many other publications like the book, The Seismology in the Philippines. The evolution of the instruments reflects the growth of understanding of this field. To complement its other seismic instrument, the observatory bought a 1,000 kilogram Weichert inverted pendulum in 1910, which served adequately until the Second World War. Later on, seismologists realized that to obtain accurate measurements, the instrument must record the tremors in the Earth's bedrock itself. This is Father William Charles Rapetti. He was the chief of the seismology and magnetic section of the Middle Observatory from 1928 to 1941. Here, as you can see, he is with three different seismometers used to detect earth motion during an earthquake. He discovered that there is a layer that could reflect seismic waves in the earth itself at about 973 kilometers below the surface. This boundary layer is now called the Repetti discontinuity. But aside from being a seismologist, he was also a historian. Here's a copy of the catalog of Philippine earthquakes, which remains a useful resource up to now. In 1899, the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey commissioned the observatory to produce an atlas of 30 maps of the Philippines. The Distribuciones de Tremblores is the first map on ground tremors in the country, which indicates the frequency of movements of the ground. The more recent work, the Combined Risk to Geophysical Disasters map of the Philippines, shows resemblance to it. The great missionary work in the earth sciences also involves studies in terrestrial magnetism. After being trained at Stonyhurst Observatory in Great Britain, Father Martin Juan was sent to the Philippines in 1887. But even though he did not finish his work on the Earth's magnetic field in the country, he died a year after, Father Ricardo Sorara continued his work and expanded it to China and Japan. Later on, he published El Magnetismo Terrestre in Filipinas. Then, until today, the observatory continues to carry on this great tradition aimed at generating better understanding of seismology and geomagnetism. Also in 1899, the observatory completed its construction of its 19-inch telescope alongside its dome. That's nine years after the lens arrived from Mertz, Germany. While Padre Farah did not live to see the telescope, Padre Alge was able to use it in February 1899. Through that telescope, the observatory was able to observe Halley's Comet, the planet Mars, long period variable stars, and the eclipses of the Moon. They were also able to draw star maps as seen from Manila. What is more, it enabled them to prepare calendar tables for the rising and setting times of the Sun and the Moon. It was helpful then because the city had to know when the moon is full, that it might turn off the electric street lights to save money. But since the telescope became less useful at night because of the advent of Manila electric lights, the observatory used it instead at daytime, monitoring solar activities like sunspots and solar flares. Detecting solar flares is important as these can involve violent emissions of charged particles which may reach the Earth. Now the observatory was also known for its time service. They used two types of clocks, the standard clock for civil time based on the movement of the sun and the sidereal clock tuned to the movement of the stars. Both were pendulum clocks affected by air pressure, the heating of the room due to the sun, the change in the tides, and earthquakes. They did everything to make timekeeping to within an order of a hundredth of a second. Time service is important to navigation. During that time, every 12 noon, a ball drops with a bang from the observatory's tower. Through electrical transmission, another ball is dropped nearly at the same time in Engineering Island near Delpan in Manila, for the sake of the steamers that are anchored in the bay. Time signals at other times of the day were communicated via telegraph to the railroad in Tutuban and via shortwave wireless transmission to the Central Post Office of Manila and the Cavite Naval Radio Station. Ships at sea received the time of the observatory through the long wave transmission of the Cavite Naval Radio Station. Since the observatory is at a 100 degrees longitude, then the ships can compare their clocks with that of the observatory to determine their longitude at sea. Consider that a tenth of a second accuracy in time may be sufficient for ships, but in making accurate maps and in tracing radio waves as they bounce in the ionosphere between the U.S. and the Philippines, Time accuracy to one hundredth of a second is necessary. As we know, the plate tectonic theory can only be verified by accurate timekeeping. 
For nearly 50 years before the Second World War, the observatory has kept accurate time, not only for the Philippines, but also for the world. Its mailing list has 50 names, including the leading observatories of America, Asia, and Europe. Just like St. Ignatius, who contemplated God in all things, in stars, in stones, even in running water, thus we have the spiritual exercises. The observatory Jesuits combine their contemplation with scientific observations to inform the community and help save lives. This is the kind of service that they started at the Middle Observatory. It has always been efficient, trailblazing, and aimed at the benefit of all. We take pride in continuing their work on Mayorum de Iguari.